on an ungodly hot summer day, in the middle of July, in a garage space in the middle of nowhere, with no air conditioning or windows, a group of friends set out to film a pilot in a makeshift video store. What came from filming on that fateful afternoon resulted in some of the sweatiest footage known to man. Dehydrated and tired, the friends determined to entertain, forged on to create the inaugural episode of what would later be known as Midnight Rental. The footage you are about to see is startling in its dampness, and shocking in its cheapness. While others would have possibly opted to wait for a cooler day to reshoot, time is money, and they had neither. The events that day were told to the best of their ability, and relied on book sources and an incredibly short amount of production time. What you are about to see may startle you. It may confuse you. Just keep repeating to yourself, It's only a pilot. It's only a pilot. It's only a pilot. Hello, I'm Lenora, and welcome to Midnight Rental, my video store that closes at midnight. Now, this place used to be a dentist office, but as it turns out, late night dentistry just isn't a viable business practice. I mean, it worked for night court, but RIP Midnight Dental. We carry all kinds of movies here at Midnight Rental. We've got comedy, sci-fi, action, drama, and of course, horror. Now, I know what you're thinking. Boy, they're really leaning into the nostalgia back there. But that's actually not it at all. We just don't have a budget and we've never been able to upgrade our inventory. <laughs> Who can keep up with all of the movie formats that studios create every 10 years to make you rebuy the same movies three and four or five times over? We can't, so luckily for us, VHS has been around long enough that now it's hot again. It's what the kids call cool and analog. I mean, if you think paying $34 for Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan on VHS is cool, well, I've got a ton of tapes I'd love to sell you back there. We've even got a back room, but it's not that kind of back room. It's where I hang out. And it's not like I'm hiding anything back there. <laughs> By back room, I mean, that's where we keep the fun stuff. And by fun stuff, I mean the weird stuff. Oh. Midnight Rental. Can you hold a copy of Ghoulies 4 for me? We're closed. But isn't this Midnight Rental? Because we close at midnight. That's stupid. Some people. Well, come on back. Welcome to the back room here at Midnight Rental. As you can see, it's a little bit different than what you might imagine your typical back room to look like. This back room is special. 
because it's where we like to keep all of the things that we've been hiding. We like to keep all of the little hidden gems of movies, the ones that people might not know about or have forgotten about. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have their own moment in the sun to shine and let you, the viewers at home, take notice of them. And tonight, we are going to begin with the lesser known films of a true legend who has consistently bridged that elusive gap between book and film for pretty much the entirety of their career. Their influence on the horror world is unparalleled and they have the fitting last name to suit just their title. I am of course talking about Stephen King. Stephen King has written over 80 books and in turn has had over 60 of those books made into film adaptations. Now, we could just dial it in and take a look at It, Carrie, The Shining, all of the heavy hitters, but that's like listening to top 10 radio. It's boring, it's tired, it's been done. Instead, we're gonna look at some of the lesser known ones, some of the clunkier ones, some of the ones that you may have never heard of. And a lot of these even started out as short stories. And by short stories, I mean very short stories. Many of them aren't longer than 12 pages. But... Ow, face. The first film we're gonna look at tonight is 1994's The Mangler, based on the short story of the same name from Stephen King's Night Shift Collection. In fact, over 10 stories from Night Shift have been adapted into movies alone. Now, the original Mangler story clocks in at 18 pages, while the movie is an hour and 46 minutes. Directed by Toby Hooper, who of course is no stranger to horror and the Stephen King universe himself, having also directed the Salem's Lot television miniseries, the plot in both the written story and the film is focused around a sleepy main town that houses a massive industrial laundry machine possessed by demons with a penchant for blood. And that's pretty much it, honestly. The haunted laundromat is called the Blue Ribbon Laundry. The main character, Detective John Hunton, is played by Ted Levine. That's officer asshole to you. Who is acting so well from the moment he gets on screen that I can't tell if he's over what's happening in the film as his character or just the script in general. There was an accident today, the worst one I've ever seen. It mangled a woman this morning. There was hardly anything left of her. Either way, he's truly giving it his all. The movie is 90s with a side of 90s. Its heavy cinematic lighting and contrast of deep shadow is reminiscent of many films of that time period. And it reminds me of the time they tried to make Alec Baldwin a superhero in The Shadow but the set is massive and ambitious and has hints of the inventor's factory in Edward Scissorhands. You'd be completely unsurprised if Vincent Price popped up at any moment and said, Hello! It even foreshadows a similar aura to a later Hooper film, the extremely underrated Toolbox Murders. And if you want fog, boy do you got it. Hooper makes an attempt at lengthening the plot by developing a subplot around the owner of the laundromat, Bill Gartley, who is otherwise not more than a passing mention in the original story. He's played by the incomparable Robert Englund, who gives this character his all as well. You stupid old bitch. Always getting in the way, god damn it, god damn it, god damn it! Gartley, in the movie, is in leg braces, constantly skulking about above the workers on a catwalk, clamoring them to work faster. Get them back to work. Work them like there's no tomorrow. Gartley has a niece, Sherry, Sherry. who works at the factory and one day accidentally hurts herself and a few drops of her blood manage to get on the enormous mangler. And apparently that's what turns it on because after that point, it just goes batshit crazy. And it also winds up crushing a foreman. Much to both Gartley's and Detective Hunton's chagrin, 
This gives the Tums chugging detective a reason to start sniffing around blue ribbon laundry. Uh, oh man, I know where you get your flaky stomach from. Uh, let me take one of those. Hunton reluctantly gains a plucky sidekick named Mark in his efforts to curb the murderous machine. And Mark tries to convince Hunton the machine is possessed by a demon that needs to be exercised. Have you considered the possibility that the machine may, may be haunted? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, Mark, yes. That's the first thing that popped into my mind. However, this is thwarted by antacids that fall into the machine. Yes, really. So the exorcism is considered null and void. Fella Donna, I think we may be fucked. Thanks to JJJ Pictureman, who dons a green and red striped scarf and dusty brown hat as a nod to Freddy Krueger, the mortician and crime scene photographer, they discover that Gartley and many of the other affluent town leaders all once had 16-year-old daughters that they sacrificed to the machine in exchange for power and wealth. These are all the rich people. The old money. Makes sense to me. Gartley, wanting to renew his stature in town, makes an additional pact to sacrifice his now 16-year-old niece. God of all machines. God that meshes good and evil. But honestly, this film gets a lot of bad rap, and sure, there are some ridiculous lines. Mark, sure. Mark, are you a virgin? Excuse me? And yeah, everyone seems to stand stupidly close to the machine they know is eating people. Honestly, this movie could have been called Preventable Deaths. But it's over the top in a typical, beautiful Toby Hooper way. Even down to the gore. Everything on set is larger than life, and it's the kind of set where you want to take the time to see everything that's in the frame. Each shot is meticulously lit. Toby Hooper was truly an incredible director who never gets nearly the praise that he does. Can I rent this one? How did you get back here? You know, I was looking around for an hour, and you've been talking this whole time. Uh, uh, we're closed! How about this one? Uh, where did you even find that? This isn't that kind of back room. It was on the shelf. I mean, can I rent it? Uh, I think this is a perfect time to take a break. What? Did you really think you were going to get away from commercials just because this is online? But don't worry. I think you're going to really enjoy these. Are you still here? Get out! Some days seem oh so long. When it's time to unwind and let yourself go, just call 1-900-725-5400 and hear exciting sensual voicemail messages from some of the most exotic women in the world. The girls of Odyssey want to hear from you, so pick up the phone and call 1-900-725-5400 right now and share your fantasies with the girls of Odyssey. Psychic Readers Network offers you a free sample reading right this minute. Take advantage of this offer, just like these real people did. Call now. I didn't tell her, she told me. Oh my God, he's giving me goosebumps. <laughs> See what these people are talking about. Get your own first-hand experience with your own free sample reading. Call now. What she said was just unbelievable. I really, really did feel connected. Now, let us treat you to a free sample. Call now. We're paying for the test reading. It just made me feel like, yeah, somebody out there knows what I'm going through without without me even telling them. Don't just watch, participate. Experience it yourself without any cost at all. We'll give you the test reading for free. Call now. 
Very good. Very good reading it was. Did it. I liked it and definitely would do it again. There's no cost to try it out. It's on us. So call now for your free sample reading. Very surprised. I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. The person was on the dot in every single aspect. Call 1-800-613-3296. We're talking to people today about new grilled Baja-style tacos at chi -Chi's. Come on. Have you tried the grilled Baja-style tacos? Ow! I'll try anything. Oh, I'd like to hear that. Can I talk to you for just a second? Do you enjoy tacos? I love tacos. I want to take you to chi -Chi's. Yes! All right. Let's go. I get to try the Baja, right? Beef, shrimp, and chicken. All in one. I think a flavor explosion is yeah. something good. Take a bite. Real good. <laughs> it's that good. I'm going to say marvelous. It's awesome. Come try new grilled Baja-style tacos at chi -Chi's. <laughs> Having fun with my daughter, Kim, wasn't always easy for me to do. It's not that I didn't want to. Oh, I did. But sometimes constipation would slow me down. I tried a harsh chemical laxative. But they can be irritating or work too suddenly. Well, I found something I could live with. Metamucil fiber therapy. Pure Metamucil fiber regulates you naturally, safely. After all, fiber is what helps keep you regular. But I just wasn't getting enough. With Metamucil every day, I get plenty. So I'm regular now, and I'll stay that way. Gives you a whole new perspective on life. More fun. Come on, Mom! Metamucil, and you could stay regular for the rest of your life. Now available in a new, larger economy size. It's Rhonda Shear. We now get back to Friday the 13th, Part 8, on USA Up All Night. Hey, Doug, you gotta keep an eye on the door. There was a guy in the back room again. But I need another Stephen King movie to talk about. Did you get anything out of the Dropbox lately? Oh, yeah. We got a whole bunch of great stuff. Um, let's see, we've got Excalibur, uh, uh, Shrimp on the Barbie. Oh God, no. Uh, here we are, Night Flyer. Oh, yeah. Oh, I kind of remember this. Tales from the Crypt episode? <laughs> nope, but it sure felt like one. Oh. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, I'll go pop it in, okay? Okay. Alright. Ah, 1997's Night Flyer. Adapted from the short story of the same name from Stephen King's Nightmares and Dreamscapes collection. It stars Miguel Ferrer, who actually has been in two Tales from the Crypt episodes. You know how many losers from Lancaster would die to be in your shoes, Larry? Do you? Oh, heck, my friends say they... Yeah, your just... mind? Why didn't you jump in? He plays Richard Dees, a splashy tabloid reporter and photographer at Inside View, who's always on the hunt for the next sensational story. Where's my picture? Where's my goddamn dead baby? I told you before, Libby, do not fuck with my stuff. His editor clues him in on a murder that's been committed at an airfield in BFE by a pilot who believes himself to be a vampire. But Dees bulks at it while sticking to his motto, never believe what you publish and never publish what you believe. Well, you know that nothing kicks a man into gear quite like seeing a woman get handed an opportunity. So when Dees' editor passes the story on to rookie reporter Catherine Blair, played by Julie Entwistle, and another set of murders are committed, Dees decides that he is interested in that story after all. Hey, it sounds like you're talking about Night Flyer. Oh, hey, Carl. Hey, I know that tape. It didn't get around much, but there's some quick facts about its start. Miguel Fierro. You probably recognize him because he's got one of those faces. He's been in a ton of flicks. And this is in his only Stephen King role. I bet you didn't know that he was also in the Stan miniseries as Lloyd Henry. I could pop your neck like a dick. Well, maybe you knew that. I'm a cassette tape, not a mind reader. I'm a mind reader. <laughs> Can it, Emmy? This is Carl's Corner. All right, all right. I'm just letting them know I'm Emmy, cause it's an M. Anyway, you might recognize Miguel Friere from his big role in Robocop as a young executive Morton. You might also recognize him from his reoccurring role as forensic specialist Albert Rosenfield in Twin Peaks. 
He was also in the Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me movie and even in the 2017 Twin Peaks revival shortly before his death. And Lenora, I gotta correct you, honey. He was actually in three episodes of Tales from the Crypt. Probably the most surprising thing about him is that he's George Clooney's cousin. Did you know he's George Clooney's cousin? I just said that. I know. I can read your mind. <laughs> okay, let's wrap up this movie, shall we? The rest of Nightflyer is Dee's trying to sabotage the young female reporter so he can get the scoop. It all comes to a head at an airport where Dee's discovers a grisly scene and has a confrontation with the vampire that ends poorly when the cops show up and kill Dee's, thinking he's the culprit. If you think that I've spoiled this for you, maybe consider I've actually saved you time. <laughs> well, not my favorite King film adaptation, the movie is not without its charm, thanks to the talented Miguel Ferrer's steadfast commitment to his completely unlikable character. Listen to me now, I don't have friends. And honestly, putting a killer vampire in a plane truly is the perfect way to keep the fuzz off of your trail. And the special effects truly are worth noting. All in all, if you've never seen it, it's absolutely worth a rental. We'll be right back. Hey, uh, can I rent this? We're closed. But it's midnight rental. Because we close at midnight. But I, the back door was open, so. <sighs> Doug! I, I just wanna. Some things you can always count on. Billy always playing, and Mom always knowing her Crisco fried chicken Crispy. will bring him home. Listen. Crispy. That's the sound of Crisco home cooking. Crispy. Not greasy. Crisco. As sure as Billy's game. Great chicken, Mom. Never being over till it's over. Bring them home to Crisco home cooking. Well, you know the bad news. Charlie Carlson looks cool under pressure. But just because his shirt is dry doesn't mean he smells good. Because underarm odor is invisible, he needs Sure Solid. Sure helps protect against wetness and odor. So, Charlie, why go to work with a dry shirt and a false sense of security? Tomorrow, use Sure Solid and be just as sure about odor as you are about wetness. I hear we have a new vice president. Thanks. My new tango student, attractive. I moved in for a closer look. Shall we begin? That was a mistake. His breath. Is there something wrong? I felt trapped. There was no place to hide. Excuse me. You're excused. How could I forget my scope? Bad breath germs pulverized. Okay, where is she? Oh, no. Ready to tango? Oh, yes. What a difference. For a positive reaction, the power of scope is the one. Two, three... We'll continue with part two of Guiding Light in a moment. Leanna is at it again. All I have to do is uh, push the right buttons and it'll all come pouring out. It could be very dangerous. And she knows how to get. Why don't we have one more drink together? And then we'll get to know each other better. Exactly what she wants. Weekdays on CBS. This is CBS. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who lived in a candy castle with nothing to eat but sugary sweets. How am I ever going to grow up healthy and strong? One day, the boy next door came to call, bringing fresh fruit, so delicious and nutritious, she simply couldn't resist. Where did all these good things come from? My mom got them at the supermarket. Kids shouldn't have to live in a candy castle. Bring home treats that are more than just sweets. For kids' sake. Maximum savings at Stop and Shop. Fire up the grill for the best beef in town. USDA Choice Family Steak, just $1.49 a pound. Maximum savings. With $10 purchase, Breyer's All Natural Ice Cream, $2.49 a half gallon. Maximum quality. All varieties Coca Cola, Tab, or Sprite. Two liter bottle, 99 cents. Our family cares about your family. Maximum savings. 
Tune in to Real Estate and see dozens of homes for sale on Smythe Kramer Company's Sunday Showcase of Homes, Sunday morning at 8.30 on TV8. We're fighting for your life. Support the American Heart Association. Oh, here's a Stephen King movie. I... Lenora, have you seen Trucks? <laughs> oh, I've seen Trucks. But before you can see Trucks, you gotta see Maximum Overdrive. Doug, pop it in. Trucks is a 1997 movie based off the short story of the same name found again in King's Night Shift Collection. The premise of both the story and the film is that an alien force invisibly possesses machinery, mainly trucks, and causes them to go on a murderous rampage, naturally fixated on humans. Interestingly enough, trucks had previously been adapted into the 1986 film Maximum Overdrive, starring Emilio Estevez, and even holds the current honor for being the only film of King's written works that was directed by King himself. Despite being in the driver's seat, King has since distanced himself from the film and has even repeatedly apologized to Emilio Estevez for putting him in the starring role, calling it a moron movie. This machine just called me an asshole! Now personally, I love Maximum Overdrive. <laughs> It's over the top in all of the best ways. It hits you in the face from the jump with kill after kill in every goofy way possible and doesn't stop. and the cast of characters just keeps going. And honestly, everyone seems like they're having a blast. I like that chicken chip! <laughs> they really should have just titled it, Buckle Up, Motherfuckers. To me, it's one of those movies that seems as self-aware as the big rigs themselves. You can't do this! We made you! Adios, motherfucker! And that's what's appealing about it. But if King doesn't like it now as a seasoned adult, I suppose I can respect that. Fast forward a decade after its release to when another adaptation of it came bouncing onto TV airwaves on the USA Network, respectively. And we've got trucks. The cover of the VHS alone used to stop me in my tracks when I was at the video store. You turn, you die? Is this an R.L. Stein Fear Street cover that got left on the cutting room floor? Directed by Chris Thompson, the movie stars Timothy Busfield, who you know as Arnold Poindexter from the 1984 movie, Revenge of the Nerds. Where are they? I think they're talking about us. No way. Did you know he's in Revenge of the Nerds? Lenora. I thought you said you were going to start locking the doors around here. I can't work like this. I read your mind. He plays Ray, who stops at a diner in Nevada with his son, only to find that something is very amiss when a refrigerator truck attempts to kill them, along with others at the diner. This causes them to be essentially trapped at the diner with various trucks forcing them inside. A cast of characters that seem equally as confused as to why they're there, there isn't a moment that goes by where there isn't something chaotic happening. 
There are truly too many ridiculous scenarios, with my favorite being a moment where a mailman meets a possessed RC car. What? Yes, you heard that right. That brings him to his fate. That's correct, everyone. A possessed RC car kills a mailman by doing nothing more than repeatedly ramming him in the ankles. The only thing that might top that is when another truck self-inflates some biohazard suits and is then able to control the suits and have them act out their homicidal plans. I don't know either. People keep repeatedly running outside into the path of the trucks. And if the Mangler could have been titled Preventable Deaths, Trucks certainly could have been its sequel, Preventable Deaths 2. I love Maximum Overdrive. It has Stephen King's love and absurdity all over it. But Trucks sucks. I'm sorry, but there's no other way to put it. I don't even drink, but this is best served with a six pack and some NyQuil. Watch it with friends for a laugh, but just know I tried to warn you. Hey, buddy! You saved us! I always put on a movie when I'm stuck at the store after hours and I'm cleaning. I'm surrounded by them. But I found that some movies have extras after the credits have finished rolling. See if you can follow this one. Oh my god, wasn't that the best movie ever? TV rock your brain. Well, of course, everyone's got different tastes, and that's what this game is all about. Because now it's your chance to play film critic. See, it's called the Babysitter's Rating Game, and to win the super score prize of the million dollar annuity, your critical ratings have to match the babysitter's ratings exactly. But even if you don't, you still could win some other cool prizes, like the totally classic 1956 Buick. And here's how you do it. First, grab your pencil and paper, because I'm going to ask you to rate the movie in 10 different categories giving each a score from zero to nine, where nine is incredibly excellent. Then, place them side by side on a piece of paper like this, forming a 10-digit rating code. Remember, zero is the lowest and nine is the highest. Ready? One, Christina Applegate's performance. She played Sue Ellen. Two, Keith Coogan's performance. He was her burnout brother, Kenny. Three, Ida Reese Marin's performance. How'd you like to have a babysitter like that? Four, the casting. Five, the story. Six, photography. Seven, the music. Eight, special effects. Nine, direction. Ten, costume design. So now that you're a movie critic, you're ready to play the babysitter's rating game. But first, there's a few things you should know. Like, you gotta have a touchtone phone to enter, cause otherwise it totally won't work. If you're under 18, you can't play unless you get your parents' permission, a total drag, but that's life. And when you make the call, it'll cost you $1.95. Oh, and the game only goes until April 19th, 1992, or until the babysitter gets 150,000 calls. And my folks say I'm on the phone a lot. So now's the time to call 1-900-78-MAMA. Anyway, like, assuming you're under 18, but your parents are totally cool about the $1.95, you pick up your touchtone phone, and remember this game works with touchtone phones only, and call the babysitter at 1-900-78-MAMA. 
She'll ask you to input your home phone number, including your area code, and then your age. Really tough, right? But that's all you have to do to be entered in a random drawing where one lucky first prize winner could win the classic 1956 Buick. I mean, talk about wheels. Or you could trade it in for $5,000 cash. Talk about bucks. And if that wasn't cool enough, one second prize winner gets a chance to win an amazing Sony Home Entertainment Center. I mean, why would you ever leave the house if you had one of those? But wait, there's more. Can you believe it? Because 100 third prize winners could win a totally radical clown dog shirt. The total fashion statement for the 90s. Pretty neat, huh? But then comes your chance to go for the babysitter rating game Super Score Million Dollar Annuity. That's $25,000 a year for the next 40 years. Yo, dude, see you at the mall. After you enter your phone number and age, the babysitter will ask you to input the 10-digit rating code you made up when you rated the movie. And she's really strict, so you only have 30 seconds to do it. So be ready to input the whole 10-digit rating code without stopping. She's already written her ratings down and given it to some totally trustworthy company who locked it away in a safe deposit box somewhere where no one can touch it. Not even the babysitter. Not even if she begged. Anyway, if your rating exactly matches the babysitter's, you can win the million-dollar annuity. Wouldn't you love it? Party! Oh, and you should also know that if more than one person gets the matching score, the winner splits the million-dollar annuity. And if no one wins, the babysitter gets to keep it, which I'm sure would suit her just fine. But don't let her get away with it. This is Sturak. Spring for the dollar ninety-five. Pick up your touch-tone phone and get ready to rock and roll. In case you spaced it, here are the categories again. One, Christina Applegate's Nine. performance. Direction, Two. 10, costume design. Oh, and one more thing. The babysitter's rating score will be revealed and the random drawing will be held around April 24th, 1992. And they'll let you know if you win. If you had a hard time following me, you can rewind or you can write for a copy of the rules to Don't Tell Mom, care of PPI PO Box 7012, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10022. Anyway. They're gonna flash all the rest of the details on the screen, so I am out of here. Besides, I got a really heavy date, and he is so cute. Later, dudes, and good luck. CBS. Hey, Buzzy TV, you can rent to own without a loan. You try the rest, mom gets the best. Hold the phone, rent to own. Don't get heated, there's no credit needed. We know what you like, get it tonight. Give it a rest, we got the best. So get on the ball and give us a call. We know the story and you don't have to worry. What we're trying to say is call us today. Visit Budget TV Rentals' newest location in Oakwood Plaza Shopping Center in Lorraine. Come to your Lazy Boy Showcase shops for special anniversary savings. What kind of savings? 25 to 40 percent, which means you can take your choice for only $2.99. And these are only $3.99, with similar savings on every chair, sofa, sleep sofa, and modular piece in stock, with savings to 40 percent. Free layaway, free delivery, financing available, plus a lifetime warranty on mechanism, two-year warranty on frame. Anniversary savings only at these Lazy Boy Showcase shops. Savings to 40 percent now. They were divorced during the span of our relationship. And um, he also had three stepchildren that were older. Why are so many old men getting involved with young women next, Donnie? Today at 5 on TV8. I'm Robin Swoboda. Join me tonight on News Center 8. We're proud to be your news. This portion of Guiding Light is presented by Tartar Controlled Crest, the dentist's choice to help keep your teeth tartar free. And by Pringles Potato Chips, now in nine delicious varieties. <coughs> Guys, I thought we were running a fog machine. It was just cheaper this way. I know we don't have a budget, but come on. All right, it is now that time of the evening when we are going to visit one of my, what is sure to be, favorite recurring segments in this series, The Six Degrees of Tom Savini. That's right, 
every episode, we're going to take a look at how famed makeup and special effects artist Tom Savini is tied into every movie that we talk about. And you cannot mention Stephen King without knowing Tom Savini's connected in some way. Of course, I'm going to talk about Creepshow. Creepshow, the most fun you'll ever have being scared. Creepshow, the beloved George Romero and Stephen King feature film anthology dedicated to EC Comics. Savini served as the special effects artist, having worked with Romero on several previous films, including Night Riders, in which Stephen King had a cameo. Romero and King were first introduced after Romero had released his film Martin. With the intention of working on the theatrical adaptation of Salem's Lot, which Warner Brothers had secured the rights to. The studio ultimately chose to release it as a television miniseries instead, directed by Toby Hooper, and King opted out of the project. Romero and King, still with a strong desire to work with one another, discussed making a film adaptation of King's novel, The Stand, but were stuck at who would finance such a massive undertaking. Romero then thought to do an anthology movie together, with three short stories within a movie, when King said, We both grew up reading EC Comics. Let's go that route. Within 60 days, King had written a screenplay for Creepshow, which contained five short comic book-style tales of terror. Three of the stories had previously been published, and two were original. Romero hand-selected Savini as special effects artist for the film. Uh, Tom's devoted to it, and he doesn't flinch, and he goes for it. He, He just goes for it which Savini gladly accepted. In his own words, he'd been known by that point as the king of gore, and Creepshow would finally give him the chance to create what he could dream up in his mind, monsters. I had read that you felt that your work on Creepshow would help eliminate uh, that unwanted nickname that you have as king of the splatter uh, makeup. Yes, the splatter king. Uh, but yeah, we've all, uh, we've all done the splatter movies, um, and they've gone on to now making monsters. I am lucky enough that I got to do Creepshow where I can now do these monsters and get away from the, the splatter stuff. Uh, I mean, there's some gore in Creepshow, very little, but um, I hope to get my name disassociated with splatter. Mm-hmm. There's a book out called Splatter Movies. Boy. There's a whole chapter on me. And, you know. and create monsters he did. Utilizing just a two-person team of himself and 17-year-old assistant Daryl Ferrucci, they single-handedly created all of the effects for the film. From catapulting thousands of cockroaches out of E.G. Marshall's head to creating the terrifying creature, affectionately referred to as Fluffy, in The Crate, to transforming Stephen King into a grass-covered Jody Varel, I'm growing. Savini and his young assistant did the impossible and pulled it all off. Even the skeleton in the window, which in fact was a real human skeleton, was fitted to be fully armatured so they could completely control the movement down to its beckoning hand. Creepshow not only had a solid crew foundation, but a cast of stars, such as the aforementioned E.G. Marshall, Leslie Nielsen, Adrian Barbeau, Ed Harris, and Ted Danson. During pre-production, Tom Atkins told Romero that he really wanted to play Geordie in the story, The Lonesome Death of Geordie Verrill, and Romero had to inform him that the part of Geordie would be played by Stephen King. So, Tom Atkins wound up playing the father to Billy, which were the opening and closing sequences in the film. The story focuses on a man, Geordie, who discovers a meteor has landed in his yard, and after it's cracked open, causes strange grass to grow at an alarming rate over everything, including Geordie himself. I'm growing. King, described by Savini as just a big 13-year-old kid, put on a truly over-the-top performance as Jordy, which in my opinion is an absolute joy to experience how much fun he has with the role. Meteor ship. In the Creepshow documentary, Just Desserts, Savini has described attempting to put makeup and practical effects on King as the most difficult set experience he's had. Nothing worked on King, he said, from the green-colored contact lenses to attempting to put a tongue growing grass on it in his mouth. No. No, 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 no. 
But in the end, they did successfully manage to engulf Jordy with all the green stuff, even though it was Ferrucci wearing the grass-covered suit in the final scene. The Savini-King connection has continued on. Billy, in the film, was played by Stephen King's own son, Joe, who has gone on to become a wildly successful writer as Joe Hill. His time on the Creepshow set with Savini formed a deep bond between the two. Hill has gone on to write several novels, along with the fantastic graphic novel series Lock and Key, which was developed into a Netflix series. The series features the Savini Squad, a nod to Tom and his unquestioned influence on Hill's foray into horror. Savini makes a cameo in Lock and Key, and even designed the mask Ethan Hawke wears in the most recent Joe Hill film adaptation, The Black Phone. Special effects artist Greg Nicotero worked under Tom Savini during the filming of Day of the Dead. Nicotero has gone on to form his own special effects studio and has also served as effects artist and director on the hit series The Walking Dead. He most recently has been the showrunner behind the Shudder reboot of the series Creepshow, now in its third season. Creepshow's clear influence and continued popularity in horror culture is unquestioned, and we have three of the most beloved icons to thank for that. Stephen King has gone on to publish over 70 books, has sold over 350 million copies, and hasn't stopped since. His written works have been adapted into countless film and television adaptations and even stage productions. I am the sound of distant thunder. I'm happy. I am a song of endless wonder. But someday, oh my, someday, someone will know my name. This is the version that the authors want out there. It's, it feels like the cherry on top of, of being a part of, of this show. I don't worry if I call my SAT. I worry, what can I possibly do? Stephen King is no stranger to the screen himself, having made numerous cameos. You cannot have the ability to create that many characters without being one yourself, and Stephen King certainly is. When he's not making cameos in films, he's giving incredibly entertaining interviews and has even made commercials. In fact, that's enough information out of me. Why don't we take a look at some of Stephen King's off-the-cuff appearances? One really good way to take a chill off all this Texas heat is to give yourself a good scare. What better way to do that than come on down to the public library and check out a Stephen King book? After all, who could possibly be scarier than Stephen King? Well, let's put it this way. I don't like subtlety. My real philosophy is let's beat this thing with a stick till it don't move no more. In fact, Stephen King is so scary that he even scares himself. You develop your imagination to a point, and it's like developing uh, your trapezius muscles or anything else. I've worked for a long time to sharpen my imagination, so sure, sometimes I get cut. Um, I'm the guy who holds the plane up, okay? If you fly with me, you're safe. On every plane, my theory is that there's one guy that keeps the plane from crashing. The only planes that crash are planes where there isn't a guy who's scared to death that one scared person is holding the plane up because I don't care what it says in all those books about how they can fly and it's physically possible. It's totally impossible for a 727 to fly. Anybody who's ever looked at one knows they can't get off the ground unless there's a very scared person to hold it up. I am that person. You're safe with me anywhere you go because I am terrified for everybody. What is the scariest thing you've ever thought of? I check the kids every night, walking in some night and finding one of them dead in bed. Personally, for me, that's, that's it because it's the, I can't see beyond that point. When my imagination draws the curtain, uh, that's the worst thing I can think of currently. Why do you think your ability to terrify people makes them love you? It's a, 
it's a tough question. I'm not sure I really know the answer to it, but I do know that on the last tour, what I heard the most was, you scare the hell out of me, can I have a hug? <laughs> so, you know, I've become sort of America's teddy bear with little daggers or something. <laughs> Well, I, can't, I can't figure it out. I mean, it's, it's kind of masochistic, but hey, it pays the bills. You know what I'm saying? Weird. It's all very weird to me. Don't you become very conscious of the, the big screen and the possibility of movie rights and lots of money when you're writing? Why would I even think about that? I got more money than I can spend. <gasps> Hi! Do you know what scares me? People who don't use their local library. Actually, it's a great place for everything. From watching videos and listening to music to using a computer, even literacy training and family reading groups. And of course, it's still the place to find all the books you could ever want. So check out your local library. Who knows? We might just run into each other. Anderson Lee. That is, that is the greatest Q-tip I've ever seen. <laughs> now, that, that, that looks very uh, natural, very lovely. Yeah, I knew it was humid today, but man. <laughs> I know. I wanted it straight. My next guest, the world's most popular novelist, has sold more than 300 million books in 33 languages. I didn't even know there were 33 languages. A big, thick one. Not one of those little weenie books, Kevin. <laughs> you get your money's worth with this baby right here. Please welcome Stephen King. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Well, Why do you guys never get to get on the Tonight Show? <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. You're that's on a good great. night here. I yeah. am on a great night. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. this is well, this is Excellent. sort of a present because you just had your 51st birthday, right? Yeah, I did. Can I say your age? Do you mind? You, well, you did. It's well, too late. Yeah, well, you know. well, happy birthday. Well, thanks. Did you celebrate? No, I don't. Um, no? My view about birthdays is they're good for a while. You're yeah. seventh, you get a bike. Yeah. You're fourteenth, somebody gives you an issue of Playboy, your uncle slips your Playboy. <laughs> Twenty-one, you can buy your first legal drink. Right. You get to be fifty, your warranty runs out. Okay? <laughs> no more promises, anything like that. So I have a a celebratory, gee, I'm not dead yet party. Oh, what a lovely 51. Oh, what a lovely, lovely way to celebrate. It, yeah, kind of warm and gushy inside. <laughs> How about your kids' birth? You, you, you... You're not a killjoy with them. Well, I try not to yeah. be a killjoy on them. You, you can't very well take the kid on your lap and say, guess what? You're a year closer to the worms. <laughs> yeah, that's, you, you can't know. do that. Yeah, no. you're <laughs> that you. See, you always got that there's a lot of urban legends about you. Like, you always seen the tabloids. I read one that said, uh, this is a while ago. This is like you with Elvis's motorcycle. Yeah, the same kind of dopey yeah. thing, yeah. yeah. It said that you are... Uh, Although you write these scary books... But you do have Elvis's No, I motorcycle. do not have Elvis's motorcycle. <laughs> no, I do not have Elvis... Now, stop that! <laughs> it said you sleep with the lights on. It said that you're so scared. You sleep... <laughs> do you sleep with the lights on? <laughs> Just a nightlight. Oh, you keep... Oh, so you keep a nightlight. <laughs> really? Now, why? Now, why is that? Well... <laughs> what's wrong with it? Well, let me ask you, why does the monster never go for the head? I mean, the head is sticking out. you think that would be an easy target. <laughs> you don't eat dessert first. <laughs> <laughs> This, this dark sort of things that you write all the time, and you seem like a lively, fun, fun guy in, yeah. in real life. Do you, have you I ever have been the heart a of a small boy? I keep it in a jar on my desk. Yeah. <laughs> for years. Do you know me? It's frightening how many novels of suspense I've written. But still, when I'm not recognized, it just kills me. So instead of saying I wrote Carrie, I carry the American Express card. Without it, isn't life a little scary? To apply for the card, look for an application and take one. The American Express card. Don't be home without it. Regulators, a couple of books, two at a time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are released today. Please welcome the very scary Stephen King. Stephen! <laughs> Sure. Actually, David, those yeah. are not the two most recent is ones. Is that right? Yeah. This is a little something I did in the green room just for you. I want you to have the first copy. Right, let's take a look at that. You're in the green room. Yeah. Stephen King, I wrote this book while, I, while Dave was introducing me. Wow! And you get it up here. 
Oh, well, I finished it while you were doing that, yeah. But, uh, you clap, go ahead, clap if you want. Writers never get to do stuff like this. We sit home but in the word processor, but... Yeah, yeah, but you're worth like a half a billion dollars, so what do you care? <laughs> hey, listen, look who's talking. Uh, um, <laughs> Easy pass member. Hey. I'm an easy pass tag holder. <laughs> but when you started out, you couldn't get any respect. No, I okay. couldn't get any respect. The critics at all. wouldn't give you any respect at all. No. Do they give you respect now? Well, you know, a lot of the ones, you got to keep in mind that when I published Carrie, the first book, I was like 26 years old. So a lot of the critics who dissed me back in those days are dead. <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> I got a little bling from President Obama yesterday. Can I see, can I see that? Yeah. Can I see oh, that? Sight. <laughs> <laughs> when I wear this on the outside, I feel kind of like Flavor Flav, you know? <laughs> the guy from Public Enemy. Oh, I know where he's from. I know who he's from. He's got a look though, yeah, exactly. doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. Well, touch? what I, I do, I've already touched it again. <laughs> well, that's been our After Hour Evening at Midnight Rental. Thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural episode. We hope that you learned a little, laughed a lot, and even felt some love. We also hope that you learned we close at midnight. Now, in order to avoid late fees, be sure to tune in next time for our... Can I rent these now? <sighs> We're closed! Good night. I'll tell you what, we had a pretty good time considering we're all going to die, huh? <laughs> Actually, I think that's a good way to look at it. There's yeah, nothing wrong sure. with looking at it that's like right. that. Seriously. Listen, hey. Well, obviously I'm not going to get a lot of sleep tonight between mad riders, killer cars, rabid dogs, and the man who eats. Well, I think I'll let you find that out for yourself. Pleasant dreams. This is Kenny Littlefield reporting at the Irving Public Library for About Town.